Hey, good morning and welcome to episode 57 of Talking to Artists. I'm pretty excited today to talk to uh, Joanna of Remark Consulting. So she has been in the art world for a number of years with lots of experience. And uh, not only does she have, provide um, guidance to collectors who are looking to build their audience and build their collection through specifically local artists, but she also has a pretty robust mentoring art mentoring program. So today we're going to talk to her about the artist mentoring program she has going on. And in a few weeks uh, down the road, we're going to actually talk to her about how she helps support collectors. So we're going to do a little bit of both things. Before we bring Joanne on, a couple of important things. First of all, uh, next weekend, next Thursday is Canada Day. So therefore my interview with Hillary Slater will be on Wednesday at 11 o'clock live instead of Thursday. Um, have a number of shows coming up. So thank you to everybody who came out to the Riverdale Art Walk tent tour last weekend. It was super fun to see everybody and oh my gosh, it was exhausting. I just realized I'm so out of practice talking to people all day. Um, but it was so great. We're going to do it again. So this weekend at my home studio, my house, uh, Angela Lane will be joining me as part of the North Toronto Group of Artists studio tour, which we do every year. 42 artists in total. So a great opportunity to ride your bike, bike walk, check out all the art. So excited for that. Uh, Toronto Outdoor is also coming up as well. I'm part of Rave Austin, which is a um, an online virtual show that's is streaming starting, uh, it goes tonight and tomorrow. And so uh, the opening is tonight at seven and I'm actually on a panel on Friday night at around just before eight o'clock talking about kind of my inspiration in nature. So I uh, invite you to check that out too. But I am now going to uh, invite Joanne on. I see her right here. Or to catch you up with her. Hey. Hey. How are you? <laughs> I'm great, thanks. How are you? I'm great. I'm good. Yeah. I'm, I was just saying, I, we did this outdoor show last weekend, and it's like, holy cow. My muscle memory's gone. <laughs> it was exhausting, and I forgot where everything was, but it was really fun. Well, you did have your shot, so you're forgiven. I did, yes. I'm very happy about that. It's amazing how, even though, you know, it takes two weeks to kind of, you know, really fully work, um, as soon as you have it, you're like, oh, I just feel so much better, and I didn't realize I was kind of under more stress than I thought I was, like anxiety. Oh, exactly, exactly. We're getting there, Kate. We are, yeah, and I could really see it was interesting to me that instead of kind of doing the, oh, hi, how are you at the tent tour, it's like, hi, I'm double vaxxed. Oh. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> That's the new V on everybody's head. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, great. Well, it's awesome to be with you this morning. Well, and thank you so much for uh, for taking time out of your day, because I know looking at your Instagram, you're getting super busy, and I... Um, I love the fact, too, that you kind of have the two areas of your business um, with kind of the for artists and also the art consulting. But um, I understand you're also quite involved in the um, Art Gallery of Guelph with their program. So maybe you could tell us a little bit about your history, how you got to where you are, and then we can talk about stuff you can do to help artists. Love to. Well, the name of my business, as everyone knows, is Remark Art Consulting. I started my business about 12 years ago. Uh, and it has been a rocket ride um, right from the very beginning. I have thoroughly enjoyed uh, the, the ups and downs and the turns and the twists through my business. Um, so I retired from the University of Guelph in 2010. I do have a degree in art history uh, and I was in administration. And um, I decided that I wanted to do something with art because I had that's always what had made my heart go pitter patter. Um, yeah. And so I was very fortunate to connect with uh, some people uh, at the Art Gallery of Wealth, for one thing, and other people in the community. And um, so, so I took on the challenge of overhauling the art sales and rental program um, at the Art Gallery of Wealth. It was great. I had always been connected with the arts community, but um, uh, sort of superficially and uh, here was an opportunity to dig in and meet uh, meet people in the community. Um, so I did that and unfortunately the gallery is closed right at the moment. Uh, mm -hmm. We have been surfing the ups and downs with the pandemic. Uh, we're hoping that we will reopen uh, soon uh, but we're waiting to go into phase three. Um, so 
So we don't know when that will be, but we're certainly optimistic and we're looking forward to getting back into the groove because we do serve an important comp component uh, regionally uh, whereby people that perhaps don't want to purchase art but want to rent art are able to come in. I, I jury all the artwork in myself. There's about 170 pieces there. Uh, and people are able to come in and rent or rent to own. So it's yeah, a... I agree. I agree. Sorry, I'm part of the Art Gallery of Hamilton rental program. And right. you know, I think that if you're not used to buying art, um, it can be a huge commitment. And I think you're not always sure of your decision. So to be able to live with it for a little bit is so valuable. Right. And many, and many people, certainly when they live with it, uh, for for a month or two, they are able to uh, to purchase it and apply the rental price towards the purchase price. So it's a great opportunity yeah. for people in the community. Uh, and so I've I've done a whole lot of things uh, over the course of my twelve years in business, uh, and I've had some fairly broad exposure in the international market. Um, I was fortunate to uh, get connected with, in Southern Florida with some opportunities uh, to jury work and also in Barbados as well. So my, my experience has been very broad and it's been great. Uh, in addition to that, I have had the luxury and the pleasure to uh, jury work for uh, artists across Canada. And um, it's really wonderful to, to know that we live in a country where the, um, the uh, aesthetics from East to West are so different uh, artists in BC and Alberta have a much different uh, take on the environment, of course, because they're living in a beautiful place with mountains, uh, lakes, and 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 moose and and uh, and animals like that. <laughs> and the east and the east coast, of course, is charming and and beautiful, and the sea plays a very important role. Um, so that's that's been great. And in addition, I've had a very active art coaching and mentorship uh, business. And I've helped um, hundreds of artists, Kate, uh, over my career. And it, it has been joyful. Um, so let me, so you, let me kind of go back. So do you use your, your jurying opportunities to kind of just, you must see a lot of artists, like I think we all see a lot of artists who are very talented, but haven't really quite understood the business piece of it. Um, and is, do you kind of, is that where you started? Cause you saw all these opportunities where artists, where you knew they could do more or they could do better and they wanted to do better. They just didn't have the tools to do that. Well, I, I started out primarily as a focus to sell work on behalf of other artists. Um, and that, that, that piece of the equation of, you know, artists only wanting to create and not really wanting to market their own work or be their own uh, business person. And that's, of course, what art consultants do is that they are the intermediary between client and artist. Um, but as as our <laughs> environment has changed and uh, and we are now in a different world, uh, artists are recognizing that they do need to get on board to become much more active uh, in the marketing aspect of what they do. Um, so it's daunting uh, for many, many artists. And, uh, but, you know, <clears throat> they need to embra embrace it uh, because it, it, what I've seen is the most successful artists that I've worked with and that I do work with have managed to, um, to really <clears throat> embrace technology and social media in a very big way. And yeah. I, I often wonder, sorry to interrupt, but I often wonder too, um, you know, the, the myth of the artist is always that they only want to be in the studio and they don't want to do the business. And I wonder how much of that is actually the fact that if you've been a full-time artist all your life, Art schools don't teach you any of the business. They don't teach you actually any of the entrepreneurial skills. So it may not even be as much that I don't want to, but it's highly intimidating because I have no idea how to go about actually doing that because the opportunities are hard to build and gain that business experience. Well, it's mostly trial by fire. Um, but yeah. there, there are some golden rules, of course, <clears throat> in, in managing to, um, to maneuver through all of that. And the one thing with social media, whether you're dealing with people on Instagram or clients or other artists, or 
you're dealing with uh, bu uh, potential buyers face to face, whether it's at an art exhibition like the Toronto Outdoor Show or Riverdale or some of the other shows. It's always about uh, being professional mm -hmm. and uh, really knowing how to nurture relationships with with people. Yeah. Uh, and, and so I call artists oftentimes uh, that they need to to become gregarious introverts um, because you know a lot of artists many of them do work in in an isolating situation and they like that and that's how they create best um, but when you think about that component about trying to sell your work um, you know people you you have to understand that people want to know what you do and and why you do what you do because that's what sells art. Yeah, I yeah I agree I agree and I think that even with the being professional, you know I've known artists where you know the the language of art and of artists can be quite different from the language of say the average person or collectors even in terms of how they describe things and they describe color and I do think that part of that is understanding the collector's point of view and modifying your language um, and I, I've seen these conversations where you can just tell that the artist is very excited about what they're talking about and sharing and the collector is totally dumbstruck because they don't understand what they're saying you know so it's kind of translating your vision and your ideas and your thought into something that's um, um, approachable I think well and just being engaging for example yeah. if somebody does express interest in your work um, you know you're going to start a conversation you know uh, thank you very much um, I'm glad you like my work How, is there something that I can answer questions that you have are you interested in why I did this piece and how I did this piece and and begin to, to form a, a, a connection. And you can do that on social media as well. You can do that on Instagram, where if someone, if someone expresses interest, then you start a conversation, right? Yeah, um, for sure. And, and I always believe that, um, at, you know, you work under the 80-20 rule. 20% 20 of your clients are going to bring you 80% of your business. Mm -hmm. So you need to really um, understand and form relationships with your clients, whether it means that you keep in touch with them every now and again with a newsletter or with an email or say, hey, what's up? Uh, this is some new work I've done. I'm really excited about it. Um, I wanted you to have a, a first look at it. What do you think? Um, and always, always, always uh, treat your clients with respect and give them white glove service. So yeah. many, many times I have gone over and above uh, to make sure that uh, I satisfy my clients' needs so that they come back. And they refer. Like I find a and lot of my, my, my referrals are, or my new clients are referrals from previous clients. So you keep them happy. It's kind of the gift that keeps giving. But I want to start right at the beginning. So if I am an artist who feels like I've, I've got the art piece of it down, I think, um, I'm now ready to look at doing this professionally. Um, what would be maybe the tips you can give to just sort of starting off? And I know that on your website, you talk about building confidence and honest critique. So how would you kind of structure that or how would you help me through that if I'm a very beginner artist, emerging artist? Well, Kate, you know, I have, I have come across uh, different types of artists in my day. And uh, I've come across artists that uh, are afraid of success or they're afraid of failure. Uh, and so it, 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 it becomes part of the package of understanding who you are and face something face some of the internal challenges that you experience. And, you know, being an artist is, uh, is daunting to begin with. Um, you know, people that are artists have chose a profession where uh, it, it, it can be daunting. You're faced with a lot of competition and particularly now with social media, uh, Instagram has just raised the anxiety bar higher and higher. Um, yeah, there's artists, so much more to compare yourself to and there's correct. always opportunities to show to prove that you can't do it. <laughs> correct. <laughs> if you're not correct. careful. Yeah. Correct. So I always start with the, with the position of artists understanding why they want to be an artist uh, and what that means. 
you know, we're not going to talk about the 10,000 hours that you have to put in because every artist does have to do that. And I have yet to meet an artist that um, is successful based on luck. You create your own luck as an artist mm -hmm. and you're willing to drill down and commit and be determined and be able to take criticism uh, from uh, either uh, uh, other um, cli uh, potential clients or other artists. But the one thing- I think, yes, sorry. I think that's just, I just wanna to touch on that a bit because I think that's a really, really important part of growth um, that I think that is also very hard to do. You know, and it's one of the things I think I didn't fully appreciate when I went to art school, but I really appreciate it now is learning how to give and accept constructive criticism that's not intended to beat you up or be mean. It's intended really to help you become better. And it's sometimes it's a different mindset for the artist too, to be able to kind of remember that when you're hearing this feedback, but very, very valuable. And I read one of your testimonials that said you're, you're, um, you're very tough and you're very honest and tough. And I think that is amazing part of what you offer. Well, you know, it is about taking criticism and, and being able to understand that, you know, there are no bad paintings, there are no failed paintings. Every painting that an artist produces is an opportunity to learn. Um, I look at my business that way. I don't look at, you know, I, a failure as a failure. I do honestly look at it as an opportunity to, um, you know, reshape, re reform, uh, understand what I can do better and go forward. Um, yeah, and, me too. And, 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 you know, artists are uh, an interesting lot because they, um, I don't know of any other professions where um, you have to put yourself out there so, so broadly for the world to see. And then and see what happens. <laughs> Yeah. So they're looking at your yeah. work and they're and they're and they are looking at a piece of you. And um that's not easy to do sometimes, right? Yeah. Um and, and and I know some artists that struggle with signing their work um because they just don't ever feel like it's ever good enough. And you have to get beyond that to um, have that level of confidence with yourself that I've done the best I can. I mean, I'm never saying, d never put any work out there that you're not satisfied with and that you really don't think that it's your best work that you could possibly do. How could you possibly sell a piece of art to a client if inside that inner chatter in your head is going, oh, God, I wish I would have done this differently, or I don't really like how that works, or, you know, and you're trying to convince the potential buyer that they should buy it because this is a great piece of art. So I always say, yeah. never put it out there unless you're completely happy with what, you, what you're going to do. And yeah, I think that, I sort of say, I think that's also where it's really helpful to have a sounding board of people that you trust, because, you know, I think that sometimes, I don't know if the artist is always fully the best person to, to sort of to know when a piece is finished. Um, and I think it's helpful to have other, or other artists or consultants or mentors or something to help with that. But I, I have seen a couple of times too, that I think that is linked uh, with the failure of success. So if you never finish a piece, you never have to put it out there, which means you never have to sell it, which means you never have to determine if it's going to be successful or not. So it's a, it's a very fine balance. I think sometimes. I think some artists get nervous around other artists. Um, and they, they, they feel vulnerable um, to um, proprietary theft. Um, yeah. and, 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 and I understand the sensitivities around that. But, you know, um, artists can be um, their own best advocates. And, and, and many artists should be looking to other artists for resources and assistance and and critiquing and and help i think it's really really important for artists yeah. to, to understand that i agree i agree and it has to be someone of course that you really trust um, right that that you kind of can also accept that criticism because sometimes it's harsh as everybody knows my sister is my best uh, critic and sometimes what she says is harsh and you're like hmm, you get your back up and you're like no she's totally right like <laughs> you know you have to think about it she's it, She's not trying to hurt me. She's just trying to help. 
Well, you know, my job is to nurture and, and assist and to make people feel better. And you know what? It's always about validation with, with an artist. It, that, that's what they want to hear. You know, am I on the right track? Uh, am I doing something that is saleable? And um, what can I do better? And if you can sit through, you know, a one hour consultation with me and have me share with you honestly um, what I think would be helpful, then you're going to stand a chance at being able to, uh, to go forward and grow as an artist. Yeah. And so do you go right back to uh, taking a look at, we've had a lot of conversations and comments about like the artist statement and the vision and, you know, how you're taught to do an artist statement in school. You see the artist statements you see, which I find personally are a lot of confusing words that <laughs> don't really always work. Um, is that kind of where you start or where, how does your... Well, our artist statements are, in my opinion, uh, artist statements uh, need to be great because you need to, you need to separate the wheat from the chaff, chafe. You have to yeah. really, you have to engage people. So when I jury a show and I look at artist statements, um, that really within the first paragraph really tells me how I'm going to feel about the work. But I, but I want to know, I want to know expressively uh, what the artist is trying to tell me. So use good words. Use, you don't have to write an essay, uh, but you do have to write um, clearly what, what you're trying to say. And a lot of artists can't, can't do that or they need help to do that. They struggle mm -hmm. with it. But it's really, really important. And um, I think that artists need to spend time in thinking about that because honestly, an artist statement can make or break uh, somebody's first impression, a juror's first impression of how they're going to feel about the artist's work. If, if I know that an artist has taken time to think about it, they are articulate and they are really able to convey the message that they want to convey, then I'll give them some airtime. That's, that's fine. Well, and I guess the other critical part is, you know, is really being able to differentiate. Like I found that I, my, I, I just recently rewritten my artist statement. I had some help with it because I was just really struggling. But as I was looking through artist statements, I realized, you know, mine sounds so much like so many other artists. I'm inspired by nature. Like so many artists are inspired by nature. Exactly. You know? um, and when you start to actually kind of sit back and look at it critically, I kind of realized, yeah, it, I spent a lot of time on it but it still isn't great, you know? So I feel much better about the one I have now and we'll see, give it some time. But yeah, I, I think that, again, it's just helpful to have somebody else's viewpoint maybe to kind of help you get out of you as the artist. What is your vision and how do you feel about the work and what your inspiration is? Well, you can't be all things to all people and you can't be good at, at everything. Um, <laughs> yeah, I wish you could, but no. <laughs> I, I wish you could. So, you know, that, that's, that's the reality um, <clears throat> is that sometimes people need a little bit of help along the way to, uh, to really um, nudge them forward in, in some of those things like, like um, artist statements, which I think are, are very important. Or if you are going to enter a juried show, um, you know, if somebody's able to take a look at your work and go, gosh, this isn't framed well, um, you need to think about that or, um, you know, tidy it up and, and make sure that you're really um, putting your best forward. You, wa you want recognition and it goes back to brand and I know you know all about branding, Kate. <clears throat> <laughs> but, you know, your, your brand is, is important and yeah. when, when you develop a, a, a reputation and then you develop a lot of inconsistencies to what people see throughout your work. Um, I think that you go down a bit of a slippery slope with all of that. So mm -hmm. um, I just think you need to, to, to take time and, and really take time in all aspects of what you're doing rather than, you know, sit at your, at your easel and think I have to produce something today and what am I going to do? And you're forcing yourself to produce something. And um, yeah. invariably, that's not what your best work is going to be. And in this environment where there's been a lot of worries, 
There's been a lot of insecurities for artists. There's been financial challenges. There's been families that have struggled with, you know, homeschooling their kids and job loss mm -hmm. and all that stuff. <clears throat> How are artists able to <coughs> go, in, go into their space, their sacred space, which is their studio? How are yeah. they able to walk into that space with grace and with peace and calm and serenity and gratitude and say, okay, this is what's happening today. I feel calm. I don't feel pressured. If it doesn't happen today, it will happen tomorrow or the next day. And that's when you produce your authentic work. Yeah. Yeah, and I've also, um, for me personally, too, I find, and maybe because I had so many years uh, working in a, in a sort of more formalized business, I had a marketing firm versus doing the art, I find for me what is a, a pillar of success for me is actually being able to schedule those things. So, you know, obviously it's, it's easy because the being in the studio is the fun part, <laughs> you know, to spend lots of time there. Um, but I do find that sometimes by kind of saying, okay, on these days, I'm going to work on my social media or I'm going to work on or my I'm working to work on my business plan I'm going to see where I sit with my business plan you know I find to a certain degree that does free me up to not have to worry about it all the time because I know I've got some dedicated committed time to Monday's a day behind the computer and I'm going to get a bunch of stuff done and that frees me up to you know to kind of paint for the rest of the week um, well, well well social media is a monster yes and and, and everybody's caught up in in the swirl um, and, you know, it, it can become all consuming. And if I can say um, that so many artists are now caught up in, you know, the number of likes or the comments or the number of followers, and it's really driving artists insane. Yes. <laughs> and, um, and I say, you know, uh, pull it back a little bit. And so if you want to devote 15 minutes at the beginning of your day or whenever you feel good, 15 minutes of your day. If you have to set a timer, set a timer. You're going to do your social media. That's it. Um, and how you're going to compartmentalize your day. So, you know, you're going to answer the emails in order. So you're not going to look at 15 emails and start, you know, you're all over the place. You're going to, you're going to respond in the order that they came to you. Uh, you're not going to take phone calls. Uh, if if you're committed to other things in your day, um, mm -hmm. it's really imp it's really important because I understand that it gets all consuming to try and do too many things, and then it's overwhelming. And, and you, you get, get nothing done. And yeah. you get nothing done. Yeah. You get nothing well, I, done. I, and I found that recently. I was I don't know what I was. I just I was just doing the social media and not really thinking maybe about what I was doing. And uh, Julia Beanstra called me up. She goes, you know, Kate, like. You know, for a professional artist, your Instagram feed looks like a dog's breakfast. And I'm like, <laughs> she's totally right. I don't know what I was doing. I'm just like, she goes, are you a gardener? Are you a kayaker? Are you a painter? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> so I kind of needed a bit of a kick in the head because I had just kind of gone, I don't know, randomly posting stuff and not really, again, strategically thinking about your brand and your look and, you know, how you appear to a stranger who's never seen you before. You start to get into the habit of thinking, oh, it's just my artist friends. They know me, right? But that's not the point of it. So, so important. And actually, there are people now in the business who do Instagram audits. And so people will look at your overall feed and say, like Julia did, what's that all about? Is that fit Taylor <laughs> art? Where, how does that fit in? You know, because it drives me crazy when uh, artists, you know, post their favorite martini or they um you know they they post a picture of their dog or in the morning that's not in my opinion that's not relative to their brand yeah so you know i don't post personal pictures of my family i don't post pictures of trips that i've taken i stick to my brand of an art consultant and what that means and and that's 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 what I'm about to the public. That's what I'm about. Yeah, I find it sometimes for me, it's a bit of a struggle with, you know, on one hand, it's like, you know, I know what the brand is, and I know what the look is. And, you know, I wasn't really brought up necessarily in the social media world. So I don't really personally feel the need to share everything I'm doing with everybody. But then the other part of it was, 
people wanted to know, you know, about me as a person and the authentic life that I'm living. And, um, and so it was kind of finding that balance, right, between, like you say, I don't necessarily post everything about my personal life because my, my husband and my kids don't want to be on my social media. But it is also part of the who I am as an artist, which kind of trying to fit that in, I found, is sometimes a little bit of a struggle. Well, you know, I, I, I think what I see is, again, when, when artists are now doing stories and, and reels and uh, podcasts and web, webinars and so on, um, I think there's a lot of noise <clears throat> going on, but I still think that you can inflect your own personality um, to people by what you say, how you say it, uh, mm -hmm. how you how you um, convey your personality and the warmth of your personality and so on. I think that people get an idea of you and, yeah. and, 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 and you know, your art is reflective of your personality. You're, you paint what you love, I think. Well, I personally do, yeah. And for me, I can really only paint when I'm feeling joyful or happy because my work is about joy so that meant at the beginning of the pandemic there was a number of days where I just wasn't painting right so yeah the pandemic has been um, I, I and I don't want to dwell on the pandemic either because I think that there are a lot of artists that have been very successful through the pandemic yeah. um, and and so that that's that's great and that's wonderful to hear um, and others not um, and I think that I think it's overwhelming. I think it's daunting for sensitive souls uh, to, to, you know, not be in a good place and still try and produce art to sell. Um, yeah. I think that that's been a mountain for a lot of artists. And I think even if you've done well, like, you know, I can, can say I've done fairly well financially through the pandemic, you know, it's still, you're still missing a huge core piece of who you are with the lack of, you know, the art shows and your artist community and the openings and the feedback and all those things that kind of happen more organically, you know, have to go and reach out, you know, through Zoom. And it's just, it isn't the same thing for anybody, right? So I think uh, we're all pretty excited that it's almost over, hopefully. <laughs> but, you know, you have to be, you have to be a self-starter, Kate. Um, and, yeah. you ha and you, and you, and you are, and, and good, that's great. Um, you know, you have to kind of um, look for, opportunities that present themselves and and then say to yourself does this make sense and do I want to pursue this mm -hmm. and is it is it is it the right thing for me to do at this point in my career um, well and I think to me that comes back to what you were saying at the beginning where you know risking failure also is risking success right it like is. You, we've never done I mean two years ago most artists didn't have an e-commerce website and you didn't know how to do it and you figured it out and people made mistakes and you accidentally sold the same piece twice and you sort it through but we're all further ahead you know so I think you're right in that learning from those failures and not being afraid not to do something because you don't know how to do it ask people and just try it <laughs> well you know I'm teaching a course right now it's a six week course. And um, we just finished talking about the inner critic quite a bit. Uh, and that those voices um, are old stories from childhood. Um, and they're often loud, and they can be abusive, and they can be hurtful, uh, and they can be uh, un unrelenting. And once you begin to uh, pay attention to those voices, <clears throat> and and say, okay, no, <clears throat> that happened 40 years ago, not really relevant in my life anymore. Mm -hmm. and, and you think about all the successes that you have had, and most artists have had lots of successes, whether they really believe it or not, um, and begin to think about those positive things and you know, put that voice away and say, uh, gone, uh, not relevant, uh, that's blocking me from where I want to go today. Uh, yeah, well, I think we're so often trained too to, if you if you if things come too easily and you produce something that doesn't seem like it's too difficult, somehow there's no value in it. So you're not you don't take necessarily credit for the success and the things you're moving forward with, and yet it always seems to be so much easier to remember all the places you failed, right? 
it just seems to be human nature. And so it's important, I think, to consciously, when you've achieved something, to consciously say, yeah, I did that, and that was great. And I'm going to remember that story, and that story is going to be part of my inner dialogue now instead of the negative. Well, you know, <clears throat> artists are very powerful, and very often they don't value themselves as, as that way in society. But <clears throat> when you think about the tremendous influence um, that artists have, whether they're influencing people's moods um, in a positive way or they're making people reflective or they're providing calm in a busy space or they have a political message that they want to convey. Um, we are a powerful group in society and so many artists uh, devalue themselves um, mm -hmm. because they just don't have the confidence uh, of being an artist and rec rec recognizing um, that uh, we have a lot of power to change the world. So how do you help artists with that? Like, how do you kind of help them work through that, that mind shift? Because that's pretty, that's pretty heavy duty change. Well, as I said at the beginning, <clears throat> it really starts with me asking <clears throat> perhaps some hard questions about why do you paint? Uh, what does it mean to you? Where do you want to go with all of this? What does success mean for you? Does success mean financial success? Does it mean uh, the number of likes and comments on your Instagram account? Does it mean your reputation in the community? Or does it mean that you have a success with what you're doing yourself? Because, you know, I, I, I just think that is so important for artists to begin with the basics you know, you're not going to paint, well, some do. I mean, I have encountered some artists who I call it the gift, a natural gift from above. Um, <laughs> they just, they, they're not, they, I don't see them often, uh, but they are self-taught and they have magic in their fingertips. They can just do that and do it well and I say as an art consultant, and I look at art, Kate, every day of my life, I can tell when an artist has painted authentically and they've painted from their soul. <clears throat> because art then speaks. Mm -hmm. And buyers know that too. So buyers may not be articulate in understanding the nuances of composition or, or color theory or any of those things, but buyers know a good painting when they see it. They respond kind of viscerally or instinctively to the work. They respond. So yeah. I start at the basics with an artist and, and oftentimes artists are lost. They are completely lost. Um, they've lost their confidence. Even established artists through the pandemic uh, have wavered and they've doubted themselves and the sales have not been forthcoming. And that has been really uh, a, a serious ego, a blow for many artists because that was a really rough time at the beginning of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, and so I start at the beginning where um, I want to know what makes you tick as an artist? Where do you want to go? What do you want to do? What's your goal? What makes you happy? Uh, are you, do you think that you found your lane with what you're doing? Or are you still exploring? And that's okay. Explore, um, learn, grow, take courses, uh, you know, talk to other artists, uh, read, educate yourself on what's going on in the world right now. Um, and then, you know, then you pick up your paintbrush and then you begin to think about how you want to express yourself on canvas for the world to see. <laughs> and, and how do you um, help artists do that? It's always a bit of a fine line between, um, you know, looking at another artist's work and reading and seeing it and being influenced by it. And then um, I won't say like almost accidentally 
I won't say copying because that's not what I'm looking for, but you know, sometimes you can end up with pieces that look very similar to other artists where someone's admired them and the intent certainly isn't to copy. The intent isn't to steal someone else's look or brand, but it's kind of uh, an exploration they're going through, but then it becomes out there in the public domain. And that's, I think, always a bit of a, it's a challenge for artists if you see other people who are doing your work and then presenting it, you know, to galleries or shows. Um, but I think also even if you're trying to find your voice, sometimes it's hard to kind of, I don't know, I'm always torn between, I'd love to take classes, but I'm afraid that I'm going to then, you know, accidentally start to incorporate someone else's vision into my own and muddy my own vision, but also then take something from them that's not really mine. Well, you know, honestly, when you think about um, successful Canadian landscape painters currently, Current, currently that are uh, in the market and are selling well. Um, you know, there's a lot of similarities between what they're doing, their palette, uh, their interpretation of Canadian landscape. Uh, there's only so many ways that you can incorporate pine trees and rocks in Georgian <laughs> Bay. All right. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, there will be there will be that risk uh, that you know it looks like your work is very similar. I see that a lot, um, but I think the important thing is that you 're doing it honestly you 're not plagiarizing somebody else 's work uh, you are you may be subconsciously incorporating some of the things that you 've seen, but that 's okay. You can defend that. Because it is your work, it is your idea. If it's an out and out plagiarism, uh, you know, then you've got you've 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 got a problem. But um, yeah. that that's not to say that people won't buy your work. Um, it's just it's just how you feel about it inside. I think right. which so, is the so it's more of an intent um, and sort of you exploring your visual uh, kind of the visual conversation you're having with the piece versus. I mean, pure plagiarism, the intent is to plagiarize. So I guess that's a diff very different. It is. It's, it's totally different. Yeah. Right. Totally, totally different. Um, but um, anyway, it, it, it's been an interesting ride. Um, it's, <laughs> it, it, it's, been, it's been a learning experience for me, and I've learned to be very compassionate uh, and understanding of artists at their various stages, their vulnerabilities, uh, their sensitivities, their, in some cases, really, you know, the depression um, mm -hmm. that, that, that they've been facing. And um, that's a reality. And, uh, you know, it's, it, it's just, uh, it, it's just a matter of me learning and, liking people uh very much always have uh curious about um humanity and uh, and compassion to uh, to yeah. understand that not everybody is going to make uh a, you know a half a million dollars a year um but that if if that's okay if if that's not where you're coming from if you're painting from a joyful place and you're doing what you love to do. I think success follows, Kate. Yeah, I, mean, I think so too. I think that's kind of almost the classic, I don't know, even when you're looking for jobs or whatever, you know, it's like follow your passion, follow your heart and the success will come. It's and just, that's, that's not rhetoric. That is the truth. Yeah, I for sure believe that. Like, but then maybe I've just been really lucky and blessed to have had really fun jobs I've really enjoyed, you know, with doing marketing and having my own business and including being an artist. Like it's, I get a lot of uh, personal enjoyment and joy out of it as well as obviously sharing the work with others is, uh, is a pretty cool thing to be able to do. I just wanted to quickly raise one point um, that I feel strongly about. Um, and that is that all of us play a role. All of us in the arts play a role in dispelling uh, the starving artist myth. Um, um, totally agree. Because it is so prevalent out there. I come across it constantly uh, with, with, with high-end uh, clients who, you know, don't want to pay full price for something uh, or artists who uh, don't uh, carry their own voice with confidence and, and say, well, yeah, you know, 
I haven't sold in, you know, a month or two and I'm really anxious for a sale and, you know, I've got to pay the bills and so on. Um, that attitude is not helping uh, what we do best. Yeah. And, and, and there are, and not every artist is starving and not every artist needs to sell, sell their work for half price. Well, and I think, again, I, I really, I 100% agree with you. And I really hate that whole mantra. Um, and I think that to a certain degree, it comes back to confidence. Because I mean, a lot of people when they're starting out in their careers, they you kind of fake it till you make it and art is for no sure. different. Like if you haven't sold anything at this show, well, nobody should know, except for you, right? But I think I really feel that the other thing too, is that, that it is important to take a bit more of a business approach to your business of art in terms of you know, have a business plan, even if it's one page to kind of say, who's your target market and who are you trying to touch and how are you going to get there? And I personally feel it's really important to have a revenue target. And it doesn't have to be ridiculous. It just has to be something that you have something um, to kind of gauge against. And I think sometimes, I don't know, for me anyway, sometimes it just puts a fire under your ass when you're kind of feeling lazy Absolutely. at an outdoor show. And it's like, no, I got it. This is part of my job now. I'm not being the artist now. I'm being the, you know, the client contact person. Absolutely. Um, how, how are the outdoor shows being received, Kate? Are, are they operating now in a bigger way or are things still under the Not radar? really. Uh, Toronto Outdoor is still virtual. Riverdale Art Walk is virtual, but we were able to do this tent tour. So there were small groups of artists across the city that were showing. So I had, there were eight of us at Art Alchemy. This weekend is a, trad traditionally is a studio tour. So that is actually, was always kind of a studio tour and now it's kind of outdoors. Um, I think the city is thinking they might look at changing permits, hopefully for August, because we have another Riverdale in August. We're hoping to be able to run, but September is going to be super busy because all the shows got pushed to September. <laughs> I think you could have about six weeks of shows constantly if you wanted from September to October. So that, so. that, that, that there, there will be outdoor shows then, uh, Full, full force? Yeah, for sure in September. And I think it's, I think there's smaller shows that are happening. So, you know, I believe, for example, at Toronto Outdoor, they've got uh, stuff at Stacked Market. So it's smaller groups of artists that can kind of go and uh, so people can see it. But I think, you know, people are just looking forward to, oh, sorry. Um, you know, people are looking forward to just meeting people <laughs> and going out to do something interesting. Artists are looking forward to talking to people. I had to really stop myself from talking too much because it's kind of like, Ooh, a real person. I'm so excited. A real person. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, generally I think that it's, it's time, um, you know, and also then travel, like, you know, I'm doing um, Art San Diego and a show in Washington uh, awesome. in, in October. And I'm looking forward to kind of resurrecting that piece of it because, you know, it's great for the business, but also I enjoy traveling and it's a good opportunity to do both at once. I just, I think I had a notification from Art Toronto at the, I think it's October 29th at the convention center. Looks like they're doing a mix of, uh, of in-person and virtual. I can't yeah. imagine some of the big shows like Art Miami or Art Basel, where they, they had to do everything virtually. Um, that was such a challenge. Yeah, yeah. So I think for sure, I suspect that, that we will always be changed. Like, I think there always will be now a virtual component for all these shows. Uh, it just feels like it makes sense and you can reach a broader audience, which is good, although it's a lot more work, a lot more inventory control and inventory management and all that kind of stuff. But yeah, but I'm in, looking forward to it. In a way, it's a, it's a bonus. I mean, if, if these things are going uh, virtual and in person, bonus i mean more expo exposure for your work yeah absolutely absolutely i think that it's all going to be a good thing so i, I think, think once so we too. kind of get back into the momentum i think it'll when artists are feeling a bit more comfortable and confident because they have their foundation of shows and real people they're talking to and they're rebuilding their databases and they're rebuilding their leads that are coming in for commissions and stuff then i think that that will kind of help reduce anxiety i think so too and you know i've yeah. always said viruses don't kill art <laughs> that's right <laughs> so you know just uh you know people need to stay committed and 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 go forward as best they can yeah i agree right so maybe you can just because we only have a few minutes left and i, I did want to make sure that people understand about your program and i think you've partnered with a jealous curator on some of this stuff is that right she was I our have. guest a few months ago yeah lovely lovely woman so lisa lisa and i part partnered uh up to try 
uh, doing a course online. It is a, it is a six week course. Uh, we have uh, a wonderful uh, roster of students, uh, two from the US, one from Barbados, uh, one from Quebec, and the others are from Ontario. So oh, we, just start, we just started last week. Um, it was very well received. We've given students homework and everybody's excited for module one to do their homework. <laughs> Uh, Good. And we will be going forward um, for the next five weeks. Lisa will be teaching th uh, three courses and I will be teaching three courses. Um, and we'll see what happens. Uh, if, if it catches fire, uh, we're hoping to introduce it again in the fall. Um, but by all accounts, it's a good group that we're, we're starting with. And uh, I think it's been fun to uh, and I think we'll have an opportunity to spend some individual time with the artists and really and I think everybody will get to know each other uh, and learn from each other and they'll our goal is that we're not going to be teaching them they're really going to be learning themselves <laughs> yeah so you're right? facilitating their thought processes really like trying to pull it out of them and make them commit to what they want to do for sure and I'm always uh, open to art coaching and mentorship opportunities uh, it's been busy and I've enjoyed that. I've done it from coast to coast and uh, it's, it's great. It, um, I would much rather be in somebody's studio and having a beautiful face-to-face -face conversation. But if that can't happen, uh, I'm happy to do it on Zoom. And sometimes artists need, you know, two or three consultations to yeah. get them up and running. But, um, but like you were just saying too, your business also has expanded by being able to do this online, right? Versus oh, uh, being geographically limited. For sure. For sure. Well, yeah. it, is, it is primarily, um, you know, and I'm really looking forward to the day when I can go into people's homes again and really work with people on, a, on an individual basis. That's been a challenge uh, when people haven't felt comfortable in having me in their home. Yes, I can do things virtually, but, you know, it's about relationships. It's about, you know, building trust with people. It's about... Uh, people understanding that you're a professional and that you are good at what you do. Uh, that's, mm -hmm. what, uh, that's what's important. And we just have one quick question. Um, is this program designed just for the business part of art or are you also coaching people to find their, um, their voice through their actually art? Is it also art mentoring in terms of the process? It's both. It is both. Um, and so there are six components to the course uh, and we're doing a little bit of both because uh, Lisa and I uh, have different experience in different areas. Uh, so we are doing, we are teaching uh, what we think we can do best. So I'm tackling things like, um, you know, finding success and defining success. And you're working with that scary uh, critic, critic that abounds in you so, so freely and frequently. Uh, and I will be talking about things like uh, time management and um, and Lisa will be focusing on social media issues and uh, um, uh, the client is king working with galleries. She does. She has a lot of gallery experience. So she will be talking about her experience uh, to the artists in the group about connecting with the gallery, how to approach a gallery uh, and that kind of thing. So. Uh, this is the first time, and and I'm really hoping that we will be able. We worked hard to put it together. We I work bet. well. We work well together, and um, so I think it will be. I think we will be able to go forward next time and build on it. We don't want to have too many students, because um, that way we don't really get to know anybody on a personal level. So mm -hmm. um, it's ten right now, and it's it's great. That sounds wonderful. And so they can find you at remarkartconsulting.com? They can. Okay. Dot, well, excellent. Dot, dot oh. CA. Dot, dot CA. CA. Okay. Yeah. And I have 17 seconds left, so I've got to let you go. <laughs> and, okay, that's awesome. Uh, but very, I really appreciated the conversation. Thank very you. Very enjoyable, Kate. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Good luck and to everybody. Thanks so much for your candor. I'll guess. Yep. Yeah, thank you. All Stay right. Focused. We'll talk to you later. Okay. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Okay. Um, thank you so much for joining me. And um, I didn't get to ask her about what her hairy ass goal is because we ran out of time. But this will be on my Facebook page. We will post it to YouTube. I've just uploaded three more videos to YouTube. 
Um, and uh, Gordon Leverton's uh, interview will be on the podcast talking